Thanks for downloading the Wheels of Wisdom podcast, where I head out on two wheels to talk to interesting people about interesting things. For more on the show and to get in touch, visit wheelsofwisdom.co.uk. And so we are in the middle of the Ashes, the great sporting contest between uh, England and Australia at cricket. So what better time to talk to a man who cycled to the Ashes all the way to Australia? Now, you could get there on a flight, but he decided to take the long way and to cycle all of that way. And in a beautiful, ironic twist in terms of the location that he chose to meet me, it was underneath the flight path. So apologies for the fact that this, the podcast seems to be sponsored by British Airways this time round. I will never learn. I never learn. It struck me that we have a fairly international group of listeners, so I should, of course, explain exactly what cricket is. I thought I'd rely on a fairly famous explanation of cricket that's adorned many a cricket clubhouse wall. Let me explain. You may need to take notes. We have two sides, one out in the field and one in. Each man that's in the side that's in goes out, and when he's out, he comes in. And the next man goes in until he's out. When they're all out... The side that comes in and the side that's been in goes out and tries to get those coming in out. Sometimes you get men still in and and not out. But when a man goes out to go in, the men who are out try to get him out. When he's out, he goes in. And the next man goes in and the next man in goes out and goes in. Then there are two men called umpires who stay out all the time and they decide when the men who are in are out. When both sides have been in, And all the men have been out, and both sides have been out twice after all the men have been in, including those who are not out, that's the end of the game. Well, I'm glad we've uh, cleared that up. Never could quite understand why it never seemed to catch on outside the Commonwealth, but thankfully this man's been trying to change all that. It's no mountain side, it's just a hill that's all, but you can see for miles, and it's beautiful, makes me glad. So I'm here with Ollie Broom in Battersea Park. Ollie Broom's a uh, cycling tourer, adventurer and self-confessed cricket nut. He's looking for a, for a place to come. He suggested Battersea Park and you may be able to hear the dulcet tones of cricket balls being hit. So we're just about in the perfect spot. We've got a game behind us. People in rather peculiar uh, green and purple outfits in MCC, we have to say about that. And we've got a cricket net going behind us. One of the things I wanted to, to talk about was actually how we, we met up last yeah. week, which I completely coincidentally, because we have a mutual friend, so I followed you on Twitter, I think, that day, and then I saw a note saying that you were organising the 26-hour cricket net, yeah. which was a world record attempt last week down at the Oval, whereby an extremely sweaty, tired Newcastle student uh, went a full 26 hours with people bowling at him. So I understand you, you organised that, I believe. It was, it was, yeah, it was a, an attempt to basically take a, a world record off an Australian, to get one over on an Australian in, a, in an Ashes year. And it went well. It was, it was all to raise awareness and a little bit of money for the Rwanda Cricket Stadium Foundation, which... I've been running for the last two years. We had the Prime Minister came down and had a bowl. Awful, an awful bowl, it must be said. Uh, Aggers, the cricket commentator, came down and, and Ravi Bopara even got Albie out. It was, a, it was a great event and, and actually has worked out really well because we've got loads of new, new supporters at the charity and we're having a, a thank you for everyone who came down to have a bowl and, and help us get the world record at the Oval. When I saw you, I came down to bowl at about 10 o'clock at night. I had a little exchange with Twitter about, you know, I should come on the podcast. And then uh, saw you slightly bewildered at 10 because you'd been up uh, since 5.30 in the morning. So I'm impressed you remember who on earth I am. The reason I was there for a good couple of hours was I was so desperate to bowl him. But I'm afraid the, the best I could do was he was doing comedy catches to the, the slips. So uh, I think I managed to get my uh, get my name in the book for that, but it was a, a pitiful achievement. I did a I did a 15 hour stint of being there in the hall, uh, and I definitely didn't bowl him. My bowling these days is really lacklustre. <laughs> left arm left arm filth. Just just as I left after my sort of 14 15 hour stint, he was bowled for the first time. 
It was a decent, decent effort, and yeah. all for a good cause. In terms of your, your great trip all the way down to Brisbane, I understand it took just over 400 days and 23 countries. Did you pass through Africa on your route? Or? I did. I did a funny route. I left England at probably the worst time I could have done in October 2009, as it was. Which basically meant that I was cycling through Western Europe at the worst time. Just well, I saw, It was a particularly wet autumn. Understanding ex-Commonwealth countries that you know, that would be a fun thing to do. A sweaty Englishman comes to town and let's have a game of cricket. But what were some of the, the stranger places that you played cricket and some of the reactions that you had from the locals? So the first place I played cricket on the trip was in Belgium. Uh, rather disappointingly, I played at the British school. So it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't all that obscure. And the kids obviously knew what they were doing. And then I played in several countries all through Central and Eastern Europe, places like Austria, Hungary, Serbia, Bulgaria, Turkey, and it was extraordinary to find cricket in those countries. I mean, cricket in the Balkans, who knew it was thriving? I didn't have a clue. If I, if I tell you about Vladimir, who's the, well, he introduced himself to me when we met in the Kalamagdan port in Belgrade as uh, Vladimir, self-appointed general secretary of Serbian cricket. <laughs> and... Uh, I sort of, that's the moment I knew that I, I loved Vladimir, basically. So in some Sorry, of the areas, were you basically introducing them to cricket? Because uh, it amused me to think that you've got you know, a country that has uh, replicated your kind of, your defensive deficiencies or that have got all these uh, kind of hideous leg spinning techniques and you've kind of ruined uh, a country's cricketing uh, tradition for years. No, they, so someone like, someone like Serbia, I mean, yes, I did introduce cricket in certain places like Sudan uh, where it's not played particularly and like uh, Syria I played a, a game in a rubbish dump with several travellers and some refugees Palestinian, Iraqi Kurdish refugees uh, which was just just fun really but in somewhere like Serbia there's a thriving cricket scene of about 100 people they are staggeringly passionate about the game and that was really what it was about for me It didn't, in a way it didn't really matter that it was cricket it was just seeing, seeing such passion for something that's, it's not a widely held passion, but when you're when you're that keen about it, and it's quite tricky to get something like cricket off the ground in a country like Serbia, so you have to be super passionate. We touched on this with uh, with Tommy on an earlier podcast that actually doing a really long trip can be quite lonely at times and can get a little bit dispiriting after the initial excitement kind of wears off and that's your day to day life, but focus of being in, going in search of the perfect recipe to help keep them sane and for you you had both an end goal something to a do theme. and something to show and did you find that was that was helpful yeah definitely i think i listened to tom's podcast actually and i think i would have struggled even with the nature of his journey but well as far as i know he didn't really have a the end of his road was rio de janeiro but it didn't feel like he had an event that he was well, he definitely didn't have an event that he was cycling to very much of the mind that that was what I was cycling to and that is what kept me on the road. Okay, I was raising a bit of money for charity and I was finding cricket along the way, but Tom mentions it that loneliness and solitude are two very different things. So one of the reasons I wanted to go on the trip in the first place was to experience solitude. And I experienced solitude most of the time for four, over 400 days. I was on my own, but I experienced loneliness far, far less frequently because there were always people to chat to, um, whether it was once a day, spend the rest of your time thinking. And how much of a spectacle <coughs> were you? Last weekend I was interviewing Super Cycling Man, you can't really miss him, he's going <laughs> out of his way to be to be noticed and to really jump into the fun of it. I mean, when you, so I tell you, you weren't in your cricket, cricket whites with uh, the bat poking out the I top, wasn't. you were just a, a stranger, sweaty Englishman. It has struck me since that actually, through somewhere like Australia, it would have been quite funny to dress up as WG Grace and cycle across the outback but one I think that beard would have made me far too hot and two I didn't really want to stick out like a sore thumb but it was I wanted actually to to merge with the places that I traveled through you know one of the things that I found very difficult to, to deal with everywhere was the fact that I was cycling on a, on a really expensive piece of kit I had loads of expensive sleeping bags and cameras and laptops and video cameras and everything. I felt guilty cycling through some of these places, you know, the Central Anatolian Plateau, um, the Sudanese Desert, across India. I was definitely more in touch with the people I was 
cycling past and meeting than I would have been if I was in a car. What was your routine? Because you had a, a set deadline. The ash, they weren't going to move the ashes even if you were late. I did a blog. I did a blog halfway through my trip saying, please can you move the ashes? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I was spending so much time in, in various places. Budapest, I spent a week. Belgrade, I spent a week. Istanbul, I spent 10 days. Yeah, Khartoum, I spent five days. So I was, it was very much a slow journey and, and trying to get little delve into a little bit of what made these places so special and you know, meet. Did you, you know, try and make sure that you took time to stop? And... I definitely didn't fit cricket into most days, and generally it was it was one or two places in a country where where cricket featured. So, for example, in in Serbia it was in Belgrade, you know, in in Bulgaria it was in Sofia. And I, in between those cities, I would pedal about 100 kilometres. I talk in kilometres now because I'm a man of the world. I don't know. Uh, but six, about 60, 65 miles a day, sometimes a lot more, and actually sometimes a lot less. A travelling routine that often didn't involve cricket at all. Yeah, well, I had one of the best cricketing experiences in my life in a, in a park in uh, Mumbai, where right. I was just sitting there on a bench, kind of looking desperate to play like you do when you're a little boy. And then... Uh, Someone took pity on me and invited me into one of their games. And then this park, it's a nice wide park, it's kind of similar size to Bath- Battersea Park, but there must have been 40, 50 games going on. And you were sort of standing there in the covers waiting for the ball, and then all of a sudden one would just kind of shoot past your head from some guy that had just whacked it. Just total terror and chaos. It was just so much fun. Mayhem. In the Maidan in Mumbai, there might be 60 matches going on at any time. In England, in the same size place, there might be two or three games going on. So in terms of your trip, one of the things I wanted to, to ask was, I thought, because I was coming to see you from Hammersmith, that I can't do my normal boring route to Clapham Junction. I'll find an interesting way to go. So I, I discovered the, the Thames uh, cycle path, and I was thinking, yeah. fantastic. My yeah. commuting woes are, are, are solved. There's no more no more traffic for me. It's just right. a lovely sort of dusty park that runs alongside the, the Thames. And then uh, you get spat out onto the A3. It was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> so it's interesting to find find out, you know, how safe you find cycling in London versus some of the places along the way, and what the what the differences are. I'm going to admit that I'm I'm not a big fan of cycling in London. I always used to commute to work. Well, well, occasionally used to commute to work when I was living in London, what six, seven, eight years ago. But my bike always used to get stolen. I don't know if that's because I didn't look after it. But um, within a few months, it would get stolen, and I would be on the on the train again. But when you find the nice, quiet places, like, uh, well, actually, Richmond Park is not too quiet these days, is it, mm. on a weekend? But it used to be quite quiet. Uh, Battersea Park is one of my favourite places to come for a, for an evening bike ride. Uh, I, I struggle with cycling in cities. I'm much more of a cycling in the country. Yeah, I mean, what was the most memorable spot for you in terms of a, a route that you went through? If we're talking countries, I always say three countries stood out. India, Sudan, and Australia. And the interesting thing about the, those last two, Sudan and Australia, is that cycling through them, you have very little choice about what roads to use. You know, if, you're, if you want to go from Darwin to Brisbane, there's really only one or two sensible ways. Super Cycling Man wanted to know how you can keep water from going tepid when you're in hot countries, he's been experimenting with different kinds of flasks. He's even been experimenting with like, trying to get someone to freeze he the sounds water for like, you. He sounds like he's been planning way too hard. Water doesn't go tepid. It goes absolutely boiling. And since I've come back, I've heard from several people that you shouldn't drink very hot water. Oh but I, I, don't know if, I don't know if I'm waiting to feel the consequences or, or what, but I, I have absolutely no... I mean, I just... I carried it in one and a half litre bottles... And across Australia, for example, I had about 12 of those bottles just strapped to every bit of my bike. And, I mean, the only way, I guess, is to keep it in the bottom of your pannier so it's not in the direct sunlight. But I, I, I long to hear from type of Super Cycling Man. Well, he was Here's talking tip. about, he's got a dynamo-powered iPhone charger, so he had a suggestion that you could have a dynamo-powered fridge. Perfect. There you go. Yes. So someone out there has invented that or could invent that for uh, the 1st of August. That um, would be great. That would be really great. The Aussies might be able to help there. They all have fridges on the back of their on the back of their trucks. That was one of the joys of cycling across Australia. Was you used to get a, a truck pulling up next to you several times. The the window would wind down, and the bloke inside would go, "You look like you could do with a cow coke, mate." <laughs> and um, and I said, "You're absolutely 
damn right. And they would jump out and they'd pull out a, a Coke or a frozen bottle of water from their fridge in the back. So when you finally arrived at the Ashes and you arrived in time for the Brisbane game, I believe, how, how, how close was it? It was the day I, I arrived. The day. The day, no, uh, the day before. So uh, <laughs> it was a day uh, leeway I had. Superb. And then I've, I've seen a picture of you with, with Andrew Strauss. So what was the reaction and how, how much did they know that, that you were coming as the official eccentric Brit? It's funny, isn't it? They're all, it's all very PR'd these days. But basically, Strauss had given me a, an endorsement quote for my website because I felt that was important before I left. I'd been in touch with the ECB throughout my journey. They've been really supportive, actually. They, they bought me my bike and, uh, and a laptop as well, so they've been very supportive. And I just kept in touch, and, and uh, my arrival date kept on swinging from this day to this day and back to that day. Uh, but eventually they, they agreed that if I got, here, got there around lunchtime the day before the Ashes started, then Strauss would, would have just finished a press conference and he could come down and, um, and welcome me. So he did. He came down with a, with a, a white England shirt signed by the team. Congratulated me and then and then headed off to beat the Australians. <laughs> Fantastic. And I understand you met some of the Australian team, or at least ex players. I met right? uh, yeah I did. I, I played a game for the Marylebone Cricket Club against the Melbourne Cricket Club at the MCG the day after the the Boxing Day test finished. I was sitting in the changing rooms at the MCG and I saw this big hulking figure running towards me. They're vast changing rooms at the MCG. I saw this big hulking figure run towards me. And I looked up as I looked up from my chair, and he went into his bowling action. The ball pitched about five yards in front of me, and hit the wall above my head. And it was Murph Hughes, and he said, "You might want to move suits, mate." <laughs> and that was that was the first ter- time Murph Hughes ever spoke to me. The second time was a few hours later. I batted. I went in nine, and I got a couple of runs. And then we were out in the field, and the old England off spinner John Embry was bowling. And he bowled a rank long hop, which pit, pitched halfway down the pitch, and the bloke batting smashed it out to deep mid-wicket, where I was fielding, and I ran in, and I dived forward, and I caught my finger on the turf, and it snapped completely from the from the base. It was pointing out sideways, and I, st- I started shaking and hyperventilating and all sorts, and I was running towards the pavilion to go and get, get it seen to. Again, I saw this huge hulk of a man run towards me, and I looked up, and I thought, oh, that's nice, Merv's coming to, to console me. And he put his arm around me when he reached me, and he said, "What did you do that for? You dropped it." <laughs> uh, so did you actually get to see all, all of the matches while you were at there? Because you had a ticket for the first one, You've gone all that way, and not had a ticket that would have been great. I didn't have a ticket, but what I had was a very kind offer from someone in corporate hospitality who was put in touch with me by Tourism Queensland. My my parents and I we sat in a in a box for five days. It was it was brilliant. Yeah, it was fantastic. Actually, on my on my arrival in Brisbane. Another funny thing that was just completely alien to me was I did the Welcome to Australia party for the for the touring um, Ashes media. There were people like Aggers and all the Vaughan and all the British journalists. And then just some scruffy bloke on a bike was, was welcoming, them, welcoming them to Australia and telling them about his trip. It was an extraordinary moment for me. Quite a proud moment as well, getting to speak to all those guys about my trip and... Uh, not quite managing to inspire them about the series ahead. Yeah, well, that's a great sense of occasion, isn't it, after travelling all of that way? I mean, that, that amuses me that you've gone through four continents and then just a little game of cricket while you're there and you managed to snap your, snap your fingers. I mean, I mean, you must have had a few, a few close calls on the, on the road. I, mean, I heard you got uh, quite seriously ill. I got dengue fever when I was in... Well, I contracted it when I was in Bangladesh. And then when I reached Thailand, I was in a hostel on my first night there in Chiang Mai and basically fell ill, went to the doctor. The next day he told me I had a throat infection. He said, go and rest, take these antibiotics. And over about a week, I got worse and worse. I was going through four or five sets of sheets in my bed a day, just sweating and sweating. And it was horrendous, aching and aching more and more. I went to the reception to get some water, got out of bed for the first time in in days, went to reception. On my way back, I blanked out, passed out and fell over and fell into a cactus-filled flower bed and was woken up few minutes later by one of the maids who said you must go to hospital so uh, they took me and I had dengue fever and I was on a drip for about a week and just felt extremely weak lost a lot of weight and it takes it takes a few months to get over dengue fever but I didn't feel too bad after about 
yeah, ten more days. And I had a friend came up from backpacking in Southeast Asia, and she, I basically said, look, I need you to <laughs> come and cycle with me for a bit, and she did. And I don't think I would have probably got through it if she hadn't. I was, I was a bit low at that stage. I lost a lot of time, and I lost a lot of weight, and a lot of lost a lot of motivation. If I'm honest, like, I just, I just thought, well, I've, I've got so far. I was in a really negative mindset. I was thinking, well, I've got so far, I don't need to go any further. I'll just go home. And, and she was the one who sort of said, come on, let's carry on. It would have been ridiculous to, to give up, but looking back. Yeah, and one thing that I was really impressed with was the amount of sponsors that you managed to acquire. I think, it, I think if, you, if you choose something that is that big, well, in this case, to cycle to, I think you're, you're onto a winner in terms of sponsors. And I think once I, once I realised that, and the only time I did realise that was when I got the first couple of sponsors, you know, even small ones, and they jumped at the chance, whether it was a saddle sponsor or a tent sponsor. And then I started going for the big ones, the guys to help me fund my trip. To be fair, I was knocked back a lot. You know, I got 15, 20, 25 letters from companies saying, sounds really great, but not interested. And then it was just about putting my name out to enough companies, and, and Betfair came forward about three weeks before I left. I'd saved about three thousand pounds for the whole trip. Right. Definitely couldn't have afforded it, so it was really lucky. They came forward and they said, "Are you still looking for an expedition sponsor?" And I said, uh, "Yes." And you also raised seventy-five thousand pounds for charity as well for Lord Taverners and British Neurological Research Trust. Indeed, yeah. yeah. So one one cricket charity and a spinal injuries charity. For most of my trip, I hadn't raised an awful lot, sort of five or ten thousand. And the money all came in at the end when once, once people saw that I had achieved my goal. And um, yeah, one of the charities is very close to my heart. It's, it's helped by a friend who got paralyzed about six or seven years ago now. And he, he does a lot of work and you know, raising awareness for them. So it was nice for me to be able to help a little bit. You've just got your, your book of the tale coming out, so Cycling to the Ashes. How did that come about in terms of getting a book deal and then so we're, we're a couple of years on, how did that come to fruition and how did it take that amount of time? I, I hesitate to say it's been the bane of my life. Cause it's <laughs> been a, I, I've actually really enjoyed the writing process, but it has been a while. And the reason it's been a while is because the ashes happens every two years. You just get yourself an agent because it's a, it's a minefield out there. I was nearly, I nearly got screwed over a couple of times and nearly sold myself short I think so that was that was the first step and and then writing it was uh, having got the book deal was was good fun I enjoyed it I enjoyed it mainly because I had such an amazing time and met so many kind and generous people that having the chance to write a book about it all was sort of like revisiting all these people and it was very emotional experience I think I mean I'm emotional at the best of times but it was really emotional sort of like I say revisiting Slobodan in Vladimir, you know, Belgrade, and revisiting the Seamen family in Turkey, or Mohammed in Sudan, and all these people who'd, who'd just helped me along during my trip. Yeah, and was that something you set out to do at the start, was, you know, this would be something that I hope, I hope to turn it into a book, or it was something that came about afterwards when you were reflecting on what's next? It was, it was neither, it was, it was not before, and it wasn't after, it was during, it was while I was writing the blogs, because I, do, I documented my trip in several ways. I mean, things like Twitter had just come about, Facebook, I was documenting it on there, but also blogging, filming a lot as well. This Hungarian guy basically took on a film project and he has, we've got 26 hours of footage. And so do you have any epic voyages still left in you, happy to settle back into, because I'm saying you'll be, you're working for a cycling festival, is that right? Yeah, so the next year the Tour de France starts in Yorkshire. And, um, Brilliant! I love that the, <laughs> it starts the, in Yorkshire. Just, do you know what they're calling it? Shall no, I tell go you? On. La Tour de Yorkshire. La Tour de Yorkshire. <laughs> Which is, the, I mean, it's going to be an amazing event. They're they're forecasting, you know, three million people going to watch it over the two days that it's in Yorkshire. Then it comes down to London for a day, and then it goes back across to France. But about seven miles into the Tour de France, they start racing properly at the Harwood Estate, Harwood House, just north of Leeds, and. Lord Harwood has um, basically putting on a, a three-day festival of cycling, 4th, 5th and 6th of July next year, and I'm, do, I'm the marketing manager for that festival. Can't wait. I'm going to go up there, so I'll, uh, I'll look you up when we're, when we're there. Do, definitely. We're there, do. harassed, and remind you of this little time together, meeting a, yeah. a strange man in a park. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of cycling these days, so I, I never was before my trip. I wasn't a cyclist at all. Funny what 14 months on the road will do. 
big thank you, Ollie. For those who want to check out more, ollibroom.com and cycling to the ashes. So in all uh, good and uh, some bad bookstores. <laughs>